Welcome to the fourth edition of Field Days. This is our fall series, and we have a great topic for you today. We're going to be taking you through step by step what it is we do to have successful fall food plots. It's all about fall food plots. Step by step, we're going to be joined by John Cooner from Whitetail Institute. John Cooner has been with Whitetail Institute for over 15 years. He is located in Alabama. I'm, of course, from Northwest Pennsylvania. So two great perspectives from different areas of the country on step-by-step fall food plots. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Field Days. This is our fourth edition here in the fall segment of what we're doing, all fall-related topics. If you follow us, <clears throat> we did seven in the in the spring that were all different spring-related topics, and now we're talking fall topics. If you missed any of our other podcasts, we encourage you to listen to them. We're on uh, a bunch of different places. You can find them on our Wired Outdoors website. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. So make sure you catch up. But today we have a great topic for you. And again, this is fall related topics. And if you followed us in the other shows, we did a soil sample show. We did a fall food plot strategy show. The last show we did was uh, what to plant in the fall. And today's show is all about, we're going to take you through step by step planning fall food plots. And I'm going to talk to you about what I do here in Northwest Pennsylvania. We're also joined by John Cooner from Whitetail Institute. He's been with these guys for over 15 years, super knowledgeable guy. And he's going to talk about what he does as well and a step-by-step method to be successful at planning those fall food plots. So before we get started here, John, I just wanted to say welcome again. Well, thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're, we're glad to have you again. And I have a feeling you're going to be kind of a regular guy stopping by here. So, uh, so again, we are doing this by phone. So if you ever hear any clicking or anything like that, we apologize. But uh, with uh, all the coronavirus crap going on, it's getting a little difficult to travel and stuff. So we're doing this by phone. So, John, let's get right into it. And let's talk step-by-step fall food plots and being successful in planning a fall food plot. And I, t- you know, John and I are both very active on our Facebook group, you know, food plots for whitetail and and food plots with whitetail Institute. And we get a lot of topics and we see a lot of guys ask questions like, you know, when should I spray? What should I spray? When should I plant? What should I do? Um, So we see a lot of guys just asking kind of those general step-by-step questions. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take you through, like I said, step-by-step. And what I want everybody to understand, Jason say myself, I'm from Northwest Pennsylvania. This is what works for me. We understand there's lots of guys listening from all over the country. So depending on where you're at, your steps may be a little bit different. Your dates may be different, those kinds of things. But this, keep in mind, this is what works for me here in Northwest Pennsylvania. John Cooner, of course, is in Alabama. So he's going to be able to talk a little bit more about some of the, the things that guys face in the South when it comes to plant fall food plots. But let's get right into it. And John, when I talk to a guy... It seems like almost all of our conversations start with this, regardless of what the topic is. But the first thing I talk to a guy about and being successful, the first step in planning a fall food plot, what would you think that would be, John Cooner? Uh, Making sure that you have the right forage for the site and then doing a laboratory soil test. Okay, I'm I'm glad you said the last one because that's where I wanted to start was the, the laboratory soil sample. And that's where I start every year. And when I talk to a guy, um, you know, I tell guys here in Northwest Pennsylvania, I've been planting food plots for going on 14, 15 years now. And when you plant them that long, you know, there's always on, on bags, there's recommended dates. You know, for instance, every white tail institute bag of seed, it'll have recommended dates of planting based on your area of the country. And there's a pretty big range. It's usually what, what, like a three week range, four week range sometimes that, that those bags well, have. Well. Yeah. So, but for me personally, I found here in Northwest mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, that first week of August, if I had to the last week of July, but if I can pick a week to plant my food plots, it's that first week of August. So that's the first thing I determine when I'm determining when I'm going to do all my other steps. When do I want to plant those fall food plots? So I always shoot for that first week of August. So when I look at soil sampling, you know, and a lot of guys, I know they go out, they're going out probably now and getting their soil samples for their fall food plots. I like to soil sample all my food plots at the end of winter. And the reason for that is when you get that soil sample back, it's going to come back to you with your fertilizer recommendations and it's going to come back to you with your lime recommendations. 
Well, most people with plant plots know it, depending on where you're at in the country, and, and it's very different, there's a lot of variables, but depending on where you're at in the country, it can take three, four months for your lime to really start correcting that pH. So if you think of it, you want to plant a plot in August, you probably need to get that lime in the ground in the beginning of June. So that's why I like to do my soil samples, you know, early spring, late winter, get my recommendations back and then get my plots all limed at the beginning of summer. And I'll let you talk a little bit because I know it's a little bit different in the country, but I'll let you talk a little bit about that as well, John. All right. And, and that's that's one thing that you and I were talking about earlier. It's, it's, it's the same. Uh, the planting dates are going to be different. See, I usually plant in the fall. I usually plant second or weekend in, in September. Uh, but you and I have talked about it. Uh, what you do is you just figure out when you're going to be planting, look ahead, decide when you're going to do it. And then everything you decide to do to work seed bed up, you just count back. So from you, you're counting back in the first part of August. I'm counting back in the middle of September. Yep. Um, so yeah, and, the, and you know, lime is soil pH is the most important thing you can control and, uh, ensuring food plot success. It's, it can make the difference between the, you know, the best plots you ever saw and, and, and failure. It's, it's that important. Yeah. And the laboratory soil test, uh, will tell you number one, what your soil pH is. And number two, it will analyze the soil because it's different for all kinds of soil. Tell you exactly how much lime you need to put in. Uh, if you put it in, in most cases, if you put it in a couple months ahead of time, you're, you're fine. It depends on how well you, you work it in. Now, one thing that you mentioned, uh, that I just want to expand on a little bit is what happens when you lime. When you put the lime out and you disc it in, you, you have an immediate jump in soil pH. And then as, as the pH, soil pH continues to rise, it just does so ever more slowly. So it, it's not like you, you disc it in and then there's no activity and three months later, bam, the soil pH is up. Yeah. So that allows you, you know, if you, if you do like so many people do all the time, you'll find a spot, say, to plant a food plot that's just, just awesome. It's right before the season or a month before the season. You're going, well, crap. You know, I don't have time to do a soil test in lime. I guess I can't plant it. Oh, no, 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 no. Go ahead and plant it. It's best if you can go ahead and lime it up yep. and work work the lime in because you're going to have that jump and it will be continuing to rise thereafter. And a lot of forages, uh, annuals uh, predominantly, are a lot more forgiving about soil pH that's a little bit low and continuing to rise. So we tell people for years, if you you know find a place right before the season, need to plant it, then lime it up if you can. Uh, if you can't, you can still have a pretty darn good plot. But if you can't lime it up and then plant an annual like no plow or bow stand or secret spot for that some that uh, that, that that fall hunting season, yeah, and then get back on the spot earlier the next summer. Sure, sure, yep. And you know, and I, and I want to stress that too. And you already said it, but you know, I you know here we are July one, so we don't want to discourage a guy. Well, crap! I didn't. I didn't do a soil sample back in you know March and get my lime. I can't plant a food plot because you absolutely can. I, I, when I first started, I don't think I ever did it the right way, and I had some pretty good success with, with some pretty good looking food plots. But you know, you want to get that lime in the ground as as soon as you can. But there are there are different products depending on what your soil sample results come back. It, you know, if they come back very poor and you get that lime on the ground, you might look at some different options. And, you know, like we talked about white tail stoops, no plow is, is, is an option, you know, as you're getting that pH up and things like that. But give the guys at right. white tail Institute a call. They can say, Hey, you know, maybe you want to hold off on planting this blend and look at something like this for this first year as that pH is coming up, but in no way, shape or form does that, um, eliminate you from being able to plant a food plot this fall. If you didn't get your soil sample back in the winter, this is just an ideal scenario of if you can do it and you can do it the right way, get the soil sample and in, in, in spring, get that plot, you know, lime and fertilize there in the summer sometime. So it gives that a chance to really bring that pH up where you want it. Right. And that's something else you mentioned made me think about this is even with the soil pH a little bit low and rising, uh, you, you still got lots of options. There are some things that you don't want to try that with, like, for instance, alfalfa. Yeah. Uh, they'll tell you if you plant alfalfa, your soil pH needs to be at six and a half or higher, or it's going to struggle. So it doesn't mean if it's low and rising, you can put anything out there. But you're not you're not greatly limited. Just make sure you put something in that can handle that situation. Sure, sure. 
Yep. So now we, we've done the soil sample. Like we said, we got that soil sample results back. On that comes your lime and fertilizer recommendations. We're only spreading the lime now. You're going to wait to do that fertilizer. I like to do the fertilizer recommendations the day that I do the seed. Um, so when you yeah, get that, you know, so I want to clarify that to guys, you get that soil sample back, it's going to tell you lime and fertilizer. You're only spreading the lime, uh, there in June and you're going to wait to, to do the fertilizer recommendations then when you, uh, when you plant that seed. Right, right, right. Yep. Right. So, so, okay. So here we are, um, you know, and, and one thing we should touch on and, and John, we talked a little bit about it at first and we did these in other podcasts. So we're kind of not really talking about them here. With any fall food plot, there is some planning that goes into it. Strategy, if it's a new plot, if it's an existing plot, if it's a new plot, what's the design of that plot going to be? Um, what do you want to accomplish with that food plot? We didn't want to go into that this show because we've really talked about that in the last podcast. So we're assuming that you've kind of went through the steps and you've determined what you want to accomplish with this food plot, what you want to plan in the food plot. And we talked about how important that is, um, especially with your soil sample from Whitetail Institute, because you can specifically put what plot you want to plant on the soil sample uh, result, you know, kit, you can say, Hey, I want to plant fusion and I want to plant beets and greens, you know, and your soil sample recommendations are going to come back specifically for those blends. So we encourage guys to really try and determine, you know, your strategy and what you want to plant before you do that soil sample. That way you're going to get those recommendations that are back and they're very specific. Right. And that, again, that's not mandatory, but if you think about it, if you're going to do a laboratory soil test, it's not hard, but it you know it takes a little bit of time to go out there and get the soil and send it off. The reason you're doing this laboratory soil test is because it offers such extreme precision. And part of that is, if possible, checking the block on, on our soil soil test submission form, but writing on something, another lab, whatever you want to do. Tell them, number one, what the crop is, and number two, whether you're planting it or trying to maintain it. Sure. Then on that information, it's a little bit different for different kinds of plants. And the soil sample, they can tell you exactly what to put in yep. so that you know you've got an optimum growing environment and you have not wasted a dime buying mm -hmm. lime or fertilizer that you really don't need. Sure, sure. Yeah, and John, did you move away from your phone a little bit? We, uh, you, you, got, you got kind of quiet on us there. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, much better, much better. So yeah, so the, and those were all good points, and and we want to tell people the same thing. So you got your soil sample, you marked down you wanted to plant fusion, you wanted to plant beets and greens, and then halfway through the summer you decide, oh man, I saw these pictures and I want to plant ravish. Now I can't because I had beets and greens. Well, you absolutely can. Give the guys at White Tones Two to call. They can look at your soil sample and say, okay, here's where you want to adjust. You know, here's what you would want for for that particular blend. So again, don't That's panic. Cool. But again, in an ideal world, world, if you know what you want to plant, you have that strategy all planned out. It's very helpful in, in planning and getting all that information back on your soil samples. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So you know, we talked about the soil sample. We talked about you know, then you want to lime in the beginning of summer. Again, these are all my dates aiming for that August uh, first week of August um, planning. So the next step for me is, you know, it's actually pretty quiet until maybe the last week of June, first week of July. I look at getting in and, and mowing those plots, you know, getting them mowed down and ready to spray. So for me, I'm aiming for that August time frame to plant. So I like to get in that last week of June, first week of July. I like to mow. And I know you do this a little bit different. So I'll let you talk about that. For me personally, I get in and mow. And I like to wait, you know, just, a, you know, maybe four or five days and then spray. I like to kind of let it start growing back and then hit it with 41% uh, glyph glyphosate. That's what that's what I use to spray all my plots with. I know that's what you guys recommend. That's what I tell everybody they should use because you're going to want to kill everything in that in that plot to uh, replant in the fall. So for me, that's the next step is mowing. And I'm going to go through all my steps here, John. I think it'll be easier instead of going through one by one. And then I'll, I know you do it a little bit different. So I like to mow that last week of June, first week of July, wait four or five days, um, spray it with the 41% uh, uh, glyphosate. Then I like to wait 10 days or so. And I like to come in and I like to, to lightly disc the plot. Um, if I can. And what, what I look at doing and, and you say, okay, why do you want to disc the plot? Well, you got to think when you plan, if you don't do that, you know, are you, are you turning over all that weed seed that you didn't kill? So I like to come in and diss that plot, wait 10 days till it starts greening up again, spray it with the 41% uh, glyphosate again. Then I wait 10 days, 
come back in lightly disc. And I like to seed that first week of August. So those are the steps. So again, I'll, I'll just repeat those for me and John, I know you do it different. So I'll let you go through it. And that's, what's cool about food plotting. That's why I tell guys, Hey, if whatever you're doing works for you, awesome, man, stay with it. You know, this is just specifically what I do and works really well for me. Um, again, I come in last week of June, first week of July. I like to mow that food plot. I'll wait a few days, four days, five days till it starts coming back a little bit. I'll spray it with the, the 41% glyphosate. I'll wait 10 days and I will come in and I will tell it, you know, when everything's good and dead, I'll come in, I'll diss that food plot. I'll wait 10 more days until it starts greening up. Then when I'm ready to plant, I'll come back in. I'll lightly diss that plot, seed it, drag it, um, and pray for rain. So those are my steps, John. I know you do a little bit different, so I'll let you talk about what you do. Okay. I'm, I'm not really that, that different. Um, I, I could just add a couple of things. One is the considerations if you're using a tractor or an ATV. Yeah. If you're using an ATV, I, you know, I'm hard headed like a lot of people are. And I used to try to get on an ATV with a flip disc and go around a weedy, grassy field around and around and around. And, you know, there's just not enough downforce on a, on ATV equipment to really cut through that stuff. So I found that the best thing to do is go out. I go out with my soil sample uh, uh, kits and my bucket and everything and the, the tank around up, pull my soil test plugs, and then I go ahead and, um, and and spray it. So so it's killing everything off. And then I can come back in and, and disc. And I'm taking the soil plugs down to about six inches. So I'm not testing, you know, uh, turning over the dirt and testing something different. Sure. Uh, but Big help there. And then something else I learned from Carol Johnson, Dr. Carol Johnson, years ago, was he said, you know, you know everybody, there's a thing called, the, I think it's called the weed bank or the seed bank or something, but and the term describes the millions of, of dormant weed seed that is going to be in really any soil that you find, uh, just waiting for somebody to come along and turn the soil and bring it to the surface where it can get the there and the sunlight and everything it needs to, to germinate. And some of those weed seeds can last for decades. They have real thick seed coats. Um, so, you know, especially if you're in a starting in a fallow field, you might want to consider uh, taking additional steps. And that is between the time that you first work that lime in and when you're getting ready to plant, right after you work the lime in, wait a couple of weeks. Let the stuff start growing back from the dormant seed. And uh, it won't. And exactly two weeks later, he does this at two week intervals. After that, the plants will have grown enough to commit, but they won't have had a chance to reseed themselves. You disc again, and it kills those weeds, brings up more seed, and you're disking to the same depth every time at two week intervals, probably two or three times. We'll do it, uh, and you're not diluting your lime because you're keeping it to the same distance. You're just mixing it in better, and you're getting a lot of that dormant weed seed out of the soil. And then when you get uh, get uh, you know closer to your planting dates, I'll come back in, disc it one more time, let the junk start growing back, and by then usually what you have is grass coming up because you've taken a lot of that weed seed out. And you know it's hard to it's hard to kill grass by tilling it. If you've ever dug up grass in your lawn, you know it just grows back from the roots. Uh, but then you can spray that with with the, with the glyphosate, and it kills it off, and you end up with really a, a nice clean seed bed. But then when you're ready to plant, uh, you know, you can go and do that. Uh, you, you're not disturbing the soil enough, really, to make a difference in, in, in most cases. So I'm kind of like doing it like you are from then on out. Just get it uh, get it ready to go and then get it planted. Sure, sure. And, you know, what we talked about before, and I guess let me t touch on this before I move on, is you see a lot of questions on what to spray on your plot. I mean, all the time. I know you see it on the, on the board. People are like, is this okay? Should I spray this? I mean, we just tell, I mean, all I've used for 13 years is 41% uh, glyphosate. That's it. You know, it doesn't matter if what brand it is, because you'll see people a lot of times say, oh, Roundup. Well, that's not really telling you. There's a lot of different mixtures of Roundup, you know? So we always sure. tell, we always tell guys, hey, what you're looking for is 41% glyphosate whether that's a tractor supply or whatever store that's all you're looking for and that's what we recommend to spray on these food plots just for anybody looking for recommendations and what they should be spraying on their food plots and i think you'd agree with that no i would there are other uh percentages close to that but basically what you want to do is go in a go in a, a farm supply type store not in in lowe's or home depot but a far supply store and look at the label on a roundup product and, and that'll help you remember what you're looking for 
the only active ingredient is glyphosate. Yeah. Now that's in Roundup weed and grass killer. You don't want something with extended control because Roundup start, started putting that stuff out now too. And you don't want to use that. You just want to have a good high percentage of glyphosate as the only active ingredient. And you can tell that by looking at the label. And uh, there are a lot of generics that may be, may be less expensive. They'll work just as well. Yep. Yep. And, and so we see a lot of questions on that. So, you know, and, and let me get back to the the steps that I did with, m- you know, mowing and spraying and disking and then spraying again and then disking. I've had a lot, a lot of success with just mowing, spraying, disking once and planting. So I don't want guys to think like, oh, man, I, you know, I, this was way back in. I'm not going to get in here twice. Like, it's just impossible you can still plant a food plot and have great success. You know, this is, not. yeah, this is, I've planted many, many food plots where I've only sprayed to kill the the weeds once disc and then planted and had great success. So we don't want less than that. I've found places close to the season and I've wanted to plant. I've gone in there and just mowed the grass down just as close as I could. And, uh, and gone in there and fertilized and put, put uh put no plow on it had a great plot yeah yeah so, last minute thing, but but it, it works yeah yeah so you know that's the only thing that concerned me with doing this show is that somebody would listen to me and be like wow I, I don't have time to do all those steps this is an ideal world if you know you know i understand fortunately i get to do this stuff for a living and a lot of guys you know they, they get out and do it when they can or when the the missus can watch the kids and they can get out for a couple hours and they just don't have time to to do those many steps i don't want you to think that that's absolutely necessary for you to have a good looking food plot because you can, and I've done it many, many times. So, um, again, just to, absolutely true. Yep. Absolutely true. I, yeah. I think people who are listening to your, your podcast is, is what I've been able to, to tell is that they, they do want to know just kind of how to do it, but they are also interested in a little deeper information. They want to learn and uh, understand different, different, uh, theories about this kind of thing. Um, and it's good to have that extra knowledge, but it doesn't mean you have to apply it in every single case. That is correct. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I was fortunate. I just got some new property um, to, uh, to to hunt. And what was I going to do? Say, oh, well, I'm not going to plant anything in there because I didn't get to do my soil samples back at the end of winter. I, heck no. I've been in there. I did soil sample them and I'm going to get in and lime and fertilize, but it's in a real remote place. And, and I don't know, uh, you know, I'm going to, I think I'm going to spray it and, you know, only get to disc it and plant it. You know, I'm not going to get to do the ideal scenario. So everybody's different in what they can and can't do. So I don't want you to think like, man, you have to disc that twice to, to kill that dormant seed because you don't, you know, if, if you're in an ideal world and it's easy to get to, and you have the time to do it, yeah, do it. But if you, you know, you can only do it once that's going to work for you as well. Well, so absolutely, yeah. And I don't want to suggest anything else. Yep, yep, that's, that's correct. Absolutely, it's just a little extra information. Yep. So the one, the the kind of the last thing I personally wanted to talk about, and you know that I get questions on is, okay, so you know we taking you through it. You know now we came in and we disc the last time. You know it's been disc once. We come in, and we just lightly disc it, just to break that ground up a little bit, and we seed. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I get a lot of questions. Okay. What kind of seed spreader do you use? I personally, I've done every one of my food plots with just a hand earthway broadcast spreader. And uh, that's been successful. People always ask me like, where do you put your setting for this? And where do you do your setting for this? I, again, personally, I've been doing this so long that I like to just, you know, I'm good enough that, okay, I know this bag of Imperial Clover plants one acre and I got a half acre plot. So I'm going to use half that bag. And I can kind of tell when I put it in, you know, just with my finger pressure on how much I'm doing, you know, so you have to be real careful when you get a tiny seed, like a clover or a fusion or something like that, or, or, you know, the, the, the turnips, you know, which is a super tiny seed. And this happened to me early on. I remember, I think it was a bag of wintergreens. I think I put two acres of wintergreens on a half quarter acre plot one year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. And I was like, Oh man, that was a two acre bag. You know, I didn't even realize it. Yeah. And, uh, so you do have to be careful with, uh, with tiny seed like that. But for me personally, I've got to the point that what I always tell guys, when you got a tiny seed, it never hurts you. What you don't want to do is run out of seed. So, but if you go around the plot four times, that's okay. You know? So when you're first starting out and you're kind of trying to gauge that, Take it really easy. If you have to go around two or three times, that's okay. What you don't want to do is, oh man, I just spread an acre on a half acre plot, or I only got half the seed spread, and I have half the plot didn't get any seed because I spread it too fast. So 
just take no, it easy yeah. on on spreading your seed. And I don't know if you have any recommendations on that, but that's kind of where I've been and and what I do personally. Oh yeah, I could I could tell you how uh, I tell you exactly how I did it. And this is this is just more of a common sense type thing. Uh, and it sounds like it's extra work when you consider about having to come back and buy more seed if you get it wrong. And in some cases, with some forages, uh, crowd the root space. This this is just a simple way to do it, and it works, especially with small seeds like chicory and clover and brassica. You know, you get the seed spreader, and it comes with a chart. And I don't even look at that thing. I open the seed spreader, and I open the bag of the seed, and I look down so I can look back and forth between the gap at the bottom of, of the bag and, and, and the seeds. And I adjust the gap until it looks like some seed is going to come out, but there's no way that enough is going to come out. If you set it to that point, you're pretty darn close. Yeah. Then, then take half the bag, uh, I'm sorry, half the amount of seed you've allotted for the plot and put it in the bag. Okay, in, in the hopper, in, in the in the spreader, close it up, and then try to put that seed in the hopper out on the entire plot. Say walking north, south, north, south, and all these a lot of spreaders they throw differently. So we figured out that that about twelve feet between each pass is ideal. Okay, it'll cover you. Then let's say you're getting to the end and you run out of seed. You're like, oh crap, what am I going to do? That's okay. We're going to cover that. We're going to take care of it. When you come back, you adjust the the gap if you need to and put the other half of seed in. Then you cover the plot again, 12 feet in between each pass, but walking across your old path, say east, west, east, west. Then, uh, and you don't try to have any seed left over, but if you end up with some seed left over in the hopper, in the, the cedar bag, when you're through, put it around, put it out just inside the perimeter of the plot because that's where weeds and uh, and grass and trees are going to wick up, you know, extra moisture and probably where the deer usage is going to be heaviest. And if you do that, you end up with good, even coverage across the whole plot without having to come back and buy additional seed. Yep. Yep. That's great advice. Yep. So, so yeah. So now let's talk about, you know, I get this question a lot too, and I'm just going to say, this is, this is what I personally do. You know, as we've planted, we've spread the seed and, um, you know, now, you know, people, do you call it a packet? Do you, you know, all I've ever personally done for all my food plots is I have a little, uh, harrow that I drag behind my quad. And, you know, if it's a smaller seed again, like Imperial Clover or something along those lines, you know, I'll drag it with the teeth up, you know, just a light drag. Um, if it's, you know, a bigger seed like forage oats or something like that, I'll put the teeth down to, to get a little bit, uh, more coverage on, on that seed, but that's all I've ever done. Now, you know, I know call to packers are good and John, I'll let you talk a little bit more about best case scenario, but you know, I guess to the guy with minimal equipment, you don't need that. You know, you can do it with, you know, I've back in the day, I remember doing it, just driving my four wheeler over it, you know, just with the tires, you know, and not having to drag at all. And over the years, I've just found, you know, dragging my plots, uh, does, does very, very well. But you know, uh, John, I'll let you talk about, you know, what you recommend and what you do with, with your seed actually act after you actually spread the seed. Okay. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that people discuss seeds. They talk about them as either large seeds or small seeds. And it's very obvious, which is which, you know, the corn and beans, large seeds, small seeds, chicory, brassica, clover. Uh, the point to keep in mind is, where is optimum to leave the seed of each size in the soil relative to the surface? With the large seeds, you want to keep them under under a uh, thin layer of soil. And with small seeds, you want them to stay really on top of the prepared seed bed. That's, that's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a drag, it's very easy. You go out there, disc it the last time, put out your fertilizer, put out your large seed, and take a chain leak fence or a drag or something, just smooth over the top of it. And I tell you, well, you know, power plant has large seeds in it. It also has some small seeds in it. So what we tell people is to drag it in. And if you see a few of the big beans lying on top of the soil, but that's all, it's right where it needs to be, just underground. The rest of it is. With the small seeds, if you have a drag, go ahead and disc it, fertilize it, and smooth it out with a drag as much as you can, and then lay that seed on top and just walk away. Uh, Call to packer again is the best case scenario. It's like putting a third wax 
coat of wax on your car. It's not mandatory, but it makes it just real nice and pretty. <laughs> Come in there, you know, disc it, fertilize it, and then roll it with the cultipacker. And then uh, your your goal there is to roll it until you get it so firm that your boot tracks will sink down about a half an inch to an inch in the soil. If you if you use a tiller or something like that and you can't get it that firm, treat it like a drag seed bed, lay the seed on top and walk away. But if you can firm it up that much to where your boot tracks will sink down half an inch to an inch, lay the seed out and then roll it one more time. And that won't put the seed under the soil, but it'll just kind of seed it against that uh, firmer, firmer soil. Yep. Yep. And great advice. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the last thing I had, you know, that was all the steps that I personally do. Now, I, the one thing we didn't talk about is, is you know, is the seed new. And I like to spread the fertilizer the day of that I seed. You know, people... You know, yeah. you hear a lot where they're like, well, won't that burn the seed? Won't that burn the seed? And we don't really see that. We, you don't have that problem. And and the one thing that I was told that makes a lot of sense, if you spread that fertilizer a week before or days before, the only thing you're re- really fertilizing is that weed growth. You know, there's no seed there. You're just giving the weeds a head start um, to, you know, to, to get ahead of that seed that you're going to plant a few days or a week or whatever. So as far as fertilizing, um, it makes a lot of sense to fertilize the day of and, and guys kind of freak out about uh about that burn in the seed, but we haven't seen that at all. Now, you know, for you personally, you spread the seed and then spread the fertilizer or it doesn't really make a difference. No, No, what I'll do is, uh, I'll leave the ground, you know, a little bit rough. Like you do your last, you know, you've gotten everything completed, but I usually drag something over the surface or just lightly disc, just kind of break the surface a little bit. So you don't have a, that, uh, that hard kind of shell. And then I'll lay the fertilizer in it right then. And then if it's a large seed, like oats, I put the oats out, and then I just drag over the fertilizer and the oats. Yeah. If it's if it's a small seed, I'll lay the fertilizer in it and then drag over it and seed, or cult pack over it, seed, and cult pack again. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, and the whole thing the whole thing that I use is this analogy. I say, think about the seed as a gas can. A large gas can is going to hold more energy than a small gas can is. So. You think about how much energy that seed has to push up through the soil. And a, a little tiny, a small clover seed or a brassica seed, a chicory seed, doesn't have a lot. So if it stays on the surface of the seed bed, uh, it's going to do just fine. And uh, the oats and beans have a little more gasoline to push the seedling up out of the soil. Yep, perfect. And you want to leave it in a certain place. Yep. And the, uh, the last thing I had on my list, and this is a really important one, in the last step that I do after I've done all those things is pray for rain. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's the truth. Yep. Isn't that the truth? Yep. Get it in the ground. I like, going back, I think that's why we came out with our old Chicory Plus product years ago was because we had about four or five summers when in late summer, there was just no rain and everything was just getting killed off. And uh, that's when we started you know, putting chicory in things to kind of help that along uh, with some of our, our older products. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I would say, you know, and and I guess what I would stress with this show is again, you know, as you're listening to this podcast, you know, John's from Alabama and I'm from Northwest Pennsylvania, but I think you can hear regardless of where you're at, the steps are, you know, the timing's going to be different, but the steps are pretty much the same. You know, it's going to start with soil sample, lime, mowing and spraying those food plots, you know, however you're going to prepare that seed bed, come in and disc and spray again. There's certain steps we said, you know, Hey, in a, in an ideal world, this is great. If you can't, you know, you can do it without it. So keep that in mind. We don't want to scare anybody away. If you couldn't do all these things at the right time, that certainly doesn't exclude you from being able to plant fall food plots. I'd tell you right now in July, you have plenty of time to get out there and get ready to, to plant a fall food plot of some sort, you know, and, uh, and that's just what we want to stress to guys. And I'll just say, John, do you, you know, you want anything to add before we wrap it up here? I think you got it covered. It's basically just, uh, you know, do what you have time to do. And if you don't have time to do a lot and do what you can and choose a forage that'll, that'll, that'll do fine for that. Yep. But I think you pretty much covered it, man. Yep. Well, John, I appreciate again you being here with us. You you bring a tremendous amount of knowledge, and it's always nice to have a you know a, a somebody obviously from a different area of the country as well as somebody with as much experience as you. So we really really appreciate you being here, and I'm sure we're going to be having you back soon. This is the fourth one. We have three more podcasts and videos coming out, and we want to encourage everybody. If you missed any of our podcasts, they're all available on our website at 
wiredoutdoors.com slash field days. Uh, you can just go to wiredoutdoors.com and find the link and go listen to all of our podcasts. We have spring podcasts. Um, we're going to be doing this again next year and getting, you know, all these topics have been kind of for the level 101 guy. And uh, starting next year, we're going to get a little bit deeper into some uh, different topics and things like that. But we'll be talking about those at a later date. And uh, what I want to say, hey, it's here. It's what's today? July 2nd is today. You have plenty of time. Get out there and plant those fall food plots. Right, John? Yes, sir. All right. And hey, we want to thank everybody. Thank you again, John. And thank everybody for joining us on Field Days. <laughs>